Hi, I'm Peggy Farron, and we are live with the Understand Photography Show, where we talk about travel, nature, and fine art photography. Welcome to episode 46 with travel and landscape photographer Robert Chaplin. Hey, did you know that if you're not watching this live on Facebook, you can also watch this on YouTube later, or you can listen as a podcast on iTunes. Just do a search under the Understand Photography Show. Um, at Understand Photography, where we simplify the technical, we've got a few things coming up. We've got a ladies only weekend coming up September 15th through 17th here in Naples, Florida. So if you've ever want to, you know, if you're in Florida, you want to come around over for a kind of a staycation, come on over, fly down for a nice weekend. It's limited to three women. We start uh, with a shooting in manual class and then we shoot in manual the whole weekend but we stretch you man you're gonna learn night photography and all kinds of cool effects we're gonna go out on a boat it's just it's an amazing weekend limited to just three ladies so check that out on our website at understandphotography.com Joe Fitzpatrick is leading our Everglades work four-day workshop January 25th through the 28th and Joe is also leading a trip to the Forgotten Coast in Florida. It's in North Florida, going to be staying in Apalachicola. That area is so beautiful. I discovered it two, two years ago, a year and a half ago, and I was like, oh my God, we have to start doing photo trips here because it is amazing, amazing. So it's in April, but we don't have the exact dates yet. They'll be on our website soon. Our Photoshop Elements class is still on pre-order. It's an online class with a bunch of short little videos. Each video is three or four or five minutes long. So you watch a little bit, do a little work. Watch a little bit, do a little work. It's such a great way to learn. You know, we've had great success with our Photoshop class and our Lightroom class online. So now we've got a Photoshop Elements class coming out August first so you can pre-order it until through July 31st for an extremely cheap price I'm not gonna say it because this is gonna be on YouTube for a long time so you have to go on our website check out the price you'll be you'll be amazed and you have it for life even if you don't have time to take it right now the class right now you have access for the life the life of our business anyway and hopefully that'll be a long time and then of course our signature course is the, the four weeks to proficiency in photography that starts September 7th that's an interactive course with a teacher me so I'm gonna make sure you do that homework so that you really really learn what you're doing so anyway my guest today is Robert Chaplin and welcome thank you for having me <laughs> Robert is a landscape, mostly a landscape photographer. He, yep. he, although he's very, very diverse. So we are going to talk about a lot of the different things that he has going on. He specializes in workshops in the Everglades as well as, as his fine art photography. But he also does workshops in other cool places like Iceland and Northern Lights in Af Alaska. I was going to say Africa. <laughs> no Northern Lights in Africa, I don't think. Not this year. Anyway, um, well, let's just get into it. So, how did you get started in photography in the first place? Like was most, it a hobby or? Uh, well, like most everybody, grabbed a camera at a young age. I borrowed a friend's Pentax K1000. I ended up with one at the age of 17. Um, I actually still have it. I use it as a teaching tool. Um, but then, you know, real life kicks in. You got to get a real job. You got to work. So, it, uh, the Everglades have always been my passion. I've fished. I've hunted out there. Spent a lot of time. Guided and people were, out there. You said you were born and raised in Miami. Born and raised in Miami. That's a my real, the a Ever real Florida cracker. Apparently, yes. <laughs> and so the Everglades is, is our backyard, and, and I love it. Uh, it was until about 2009. I want to say it's eight year, about eight years ago that I got an opportunity to lead workshops for a company called the Nature Workshops. Uh, now, how did that come about? Well, the like, how did he? How did you know about them? Them know about you? I'd been attending workshops with him for probably ten or twelve years. Oh, so you were a customer. I was a customer of his for ah. a long time. Uh, his very first workshop he did in the Everglades. I was his uh, one of his attendees on that. Oh. So wow. uh, got to know him. Got Roger Devore as the owner. Got to know him. Become friends with him, and uh, he gave me an opportunity, and I took it. Oh wow! So that. That was the beginning of a whole new career. The beginning of a whole new career, yeah. So, because now you still have a business, but you kind of let your wife run the business so that you can pursue your love for photography. Is uh, that how it I goes? I guess I would say my wife supports me, yes. That's a, so, you're a lucky man. I have, you have no idea. 
and we just celebrated our 35th wedding anniversary. Happy anniversary. Yeah, well, thank you very much. That's thank awesome. you very much. Good for you. So, no, she's back uh, holding the fort down while I go out playing around. Oh, so now you lead how many workshops? Wait, how long? So 2009 you started doing the workshops? 2009, and it's kind of grown from there because until about a year ago, all the workshops were in South Florida and the Everglades. Okay. And uh, so I, I, it, and it, it, it's grown. Uh, at one time I, I advertised a workshop a month and realized I wasn't getting the amount of clients that I needed. So I went back to advertising four workshops through the Nature Workshop. So I have, an Everg I have a South Florida Birds. Bird time is beautiful down there. Oh, yeah. Or down here. Uh, an, an Everglades experience where I take you on sluice logs and swamp walks. Uh, lightning, uh, summer skies and lightning workshop. I want to take that one. Oh, just come on down. Uh, we'll be having a field trip, I think, soon with the camera club. Come I down, we'll take you on that. They invited me, but I'm going away. Oh. I was like, oh, my God. Yeah. And then, we have an, and then I have an Everglades After Dark workshop where, uh, happening during the Perseid meteor shower where we go out and photograph all night long for five, four nights. All night and long? All From night what long. time to what time? I usually pick the guest up at the hotel about 845, and we come back whenever everybody's passed out or done. What so time sometimes, sometimes like we two? shoot to sun. No, well, sometimes we shoot till sunset. It depends on the group. Sunrise, you mean? Um, sunrise, I mean. Yeah, sunrise. Whoa. But uh, most ah. of the time, as soon as we start to get maybe to the blue hour, if everybody's tired, so we're looking at four or five o'clock in the morning, we'll, we'll work our way back to the hotel. You know, I did my very first Everglades night photography a month or so ago. I told you about my friend Chris yes. Hopkins. Yeah. And so Chris, Joe, and I went out and... Um, it was right when the Milky Way started to become, you know, better view. Mm -hmm. and so I don't know, it was a month or so ago. And I was like, oh, I had such a day. It was a Friday. So that's my show day. Show day is a busy day for me. Mm -hmm. You know, I got all this other work to do and get ready for the show and have the guests and all this other stuff. And I was like, oh, I don't want to go, but I made this commitment, so I have to go. I'm so tired. I'm not even going to make it. Oh, holy cow. I got out there and it was like, Chris is like, okay, I gotta go, I gotta go home. I'm like, what time is it? It's like 1.30. I'm like, I had all this energy because it was so much fun. Yes, yeah. Although and I don't know if I could have made it to sunrise. <laughs> so, and the way we do it too, because along with just the night skies, the meteor shower, the Milky Way, we're doing time lapse. So with meteors, you don't chase them. You set your camera up, nice composition, and you just lock your cable release on a, a 20 second, 30 second exposure, depending on the lens that you're using, and you let it go. And we'll shoot for two hours. So if somebody's tired, they could really lay their head down in the truck and, and relax until we go pick the cameras up. So uh, people who go out and shoot a lot of the meteors, they chase them. They see one, they move their camera. We set up, kind of set it and forget it. And after two hours, we'll pick the cameras up, move to a new location. Okay. By then, the Milky Way has changed. Uh, for this trip, the moon will start coming up somewhere around 11 o'clock or midnight. The, when is this trip? Oct uh, October 10th, um, August 10th through the 14th. So it's coming up soon because the Perseids happen every year about uh, 12, uh, the 12th or the 13th How of August. How exciting. That's awesome. I want to go, but I'll be in Italy. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's terrible. <laughs> So now that is through the nature workshops? Yeah, all, all of, other than the private ones, all the ones I do now are through the nature workshops. Okay, and then, but people can hire you privately too? And they do, yes, and they do. Okay. I had, I had a, um, two uh, private tours earlier this year. Uh, it's $800 a day, so what they do, and I'll take four, you, you and four, three of your friends. So sometimes they split it. So I had two gentlemen earlier in the year, and then I had one person that hired me for a day. He just wanted to know where to go. Yeah. So uh, took we him get around, people like that too. showed him where to go. He paid me for the day, and yeah. then uh, then he spends the rest of his vacation going out and shooting on his leisure. Oh, fun! So, Jeez. Yeah. Now, how do you get the private clients? Are they people that just have already taken your workshops, or no? And I don't know how they find me. I'm terrible at marketing. Uh, there is an obscure document that's floating around online because, uh, like you, I have a CUA, uh, which is a commercial use authorization for Everglades National Park, and there's some obscure PDF that I show up on. Uh, sometimes it's word of mouth, and then sometimes they find my site. Wow. Yeah. And that sounds so cool. So how many workshops do you do a year? Four that I advertise, and two to four that are private. Okay. Now what do you got coming up? Uh, the Everglades After Dark. That's August. October is Acadia. Actually, you know what? I, I've, I've bumped up the amount that I do this year, so I forgot about Acadia. Acadia is October. Wow, I Acadia have a, is beautiful. I have a permit to guide there, too. And then um, Canadian Rockies. Uh, oh, wow. I'm co-leading a workshop with the Nature Workshops there. You got so. the nice, you got the, oh, I was just thinking you got the warm clothes, but I you do. just reminded me of something you told me earlier, because I was pretty impressed with all the stuff you said about your workshops. 
You actually, because you know, of course, I have a bug jacket because I like yes. to go, but you actually provide the bug jackets for your guests. On our side of the world, I'm a distributor for Bug Tamer. Oh, you are? So, yes. So uh, the camera club folks are people that finally will purchase them, but I also carry uh, one in the truck for each of the guests that come on it. Not only that, we have a, a thing called a thermocell that's a mosquito repellent, and we put that on the tripod. So we try to make everybody as comfortable as we can to get them in the Everglades in summer, because like you know, the Everglades can be brutal in the summer. This summer has been the worst ever. It has. I can't even get over how bad it's been. Oh, it and did. not even in the Everglades, just here right in Naples, it's been horrible. Even in town in Miami, it's the Same mosquitoes thing. have been, yeah they've, yeah, they've been out of control. And people shy away from the Everglades, but summer is our most dramatic time. Oh, that's, as you know, that's the only time I told you this mm -hmm. earlier. I don't have time in the winter because I work so much. We're a seasonal area and I've got all these things going on in the winter so the only time I get in the Everglades is in the summer mm -hmm. so I did go one one hike this this winter because I had a guest you know friend visiting and it was like wow it's so different with no water <laughs> and I'm not sure I guess the uh, biologist can tell us but I think because we had such a dry season was it this past year yeah, it or was this a past drought. season it was a drought everywhere we went it was dry uh, some of the domes I walked people into were dry all the mosquito eating fish all of the mosquito eating plants things like that uh, are gone oh. so when the water comes up and the mosquitoes start they come back with a vengeance so it seems to me after we've had a really dry drought season the mosquitoes are always bad oh, and they've been fierce this year oh. I've been here, I've lived in Florida most of my life. I wasn't born here, but I've lived in Florida most of my life, and I've never seen anything like this year. <laughs> it's crazy. Now, tell me about the lightning photography, because I find that fascinating. I've never even tried it. Lightning photography is a blast, and we all know how dangerous lightning is, so that's one of the challenges of okay. it. But uh, we use, uh, and anybody that signs up for it gets a, a um, uh, lightning sensor. Different companies make it, but uh, I, I provide a lightning sensor. They get one as part of the workshop. So we teach you how to get set up. Uh, we go chase storms. We, I have a, an app on the phone called Lightning Bug. I encourage everybody to put it on their phone so we can watch the storms together. And then we go out and try to get beside one. We set up, we compose the shot, and depending on how far away we are, we all pile back into the truck for safety's sake. Do you make but them sign like documents if you get killed by lightning, it's your own problem? It's actually interesting <laughs> that you say that because we all have, even when you do your workshops, I'm sure you have a just. Uh, uh, <laughs> Mine is funny if somebody said, because it, it says, uh, oh God, what does it say? You know, we're not responsible for something, something, injury or death. And they're like, oh, death? <laughs> yeah. Well, but that's so what it says online. <laughs> I told the attorney, I'm going to start doing lightning workshops. And so he, he took the release, and it says that too. And you know, there's some things, you, you, you know, if you just want to shoot from a boardwalk, it's one thing, but you, you don't want to ruin the element of being in nature and the exposure to our, our unique wilderness. So anyway, and it did say death, but then he mo the attorney modified it, so it says including death in parentheses by lightning strike. Ah. So, you know, it doesn't stop people from wanting to go out. We work as safe as we can, but there's always that element. Um, now, what are that some element. safety precautions that you take? Shoot, don't, you, you can't shoot an embedded storm. Uh, try to stay as far away as you can. Uh, the camera that I brought, because I may photograph lightning on the way back if the storms hold, is a 28 to 300, and you want to get beside the storm, watch the storm go by, because then you can compose your shot and, and let lightning happen in the storm. And or does in, this in app shot. tells you where to go, basically? Or it tells you where the it, storm is, so you know you can move over to the right of the storm it, yes. or whatever? It, it, it's radar, is what it is. And then it also has... And what's uh, the name of the app again? Light, uh, light, uh, weather light, bug. Weather bug. Weather bug. Okay. And, uh, we'll put that in the show notes. Yeah, and it's, uh, but it's also got a feature that shows you where the lightning strikes are happening, too. But, uh, and then, so we just, we try to get out, work as safe as we can, stay away from it, because if it's coming at you, it's advancing too quick and you're going to get wet and your gear get wet. If you can get pick it up where it goes sideways to you, you could set up, you could watch it go by, sit in your vehicle and let the camera and the lightning sensor do the work. And do you cover up the cameras just in case? Uh, some people put uh, those little rain jackets on them, but I, in my mind, if I'm close enough where my camera get wet, gets wet, we don't need to be shooting there. You're too we close. We need to move. Yeah. Okay. Wow. Yeah. And you can pretty much, what, 99% guarantee there's going to be lightning or 100%? No, I can't. I can't guarantee lightning. Um, today, coming across, there was places I could have stopped to photograph the storm that I hit coming out of Miami. Uh, that first workshop I did was called the Lightning Workshop. Uh -huh. And then a gentleman who uh, lives in Fort Myers had come on it, and we didn't photograph lightning until the last 15 minutes of the last day. Oh. 
And so he said, I had a great time. I've never gotten so many good summer sh sky shots of uh, the Everglades. You should rename it uh, the Summer Skies and Lightning Workshop. Uh -huh. So I renamed it for, uh, 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 he's, in, he's now a friend, Pete Seidel. And uh, the oh, next year he right. came and I think we shot lightning every single day. So he showed up twice for it. Uh, so when we have days like today, uh, you could see lightning, but you don't always get to photograph it. What we look for are the isolated cells that tend to pop up and not when we get these real big storms that blow across. Because you had something build up over here that made its way to Miami today. Yeah, it, rain, it rained first thing this morning. Crazy, mm -hmm. crazy rain. So, wow. So that's so fascinating. It's like chasing tornadoes in the Midwest, but down here we get to chase our dramatic skies and our lightning. Wow, yeah. that sounds really, really fun. So do you have any other tips for like that type of photography? So what else do you do when you say summer skies? Is it just, so I, I just thought you could guarantee lightning and rains every single day in the Everglades, doesn't it, in the summer? It try, it, sometimes it does, sometimes it don't. One year we had a, a real bad um, dry season with, we had like the Sahara sands blow over us, I think and uh, the atmosphere just didn't have the ability to make the storm. So there was one year it was a slow year for it. Wow. But uh, no, the tips are just be safe, uh, use a lens. I like to use zoom lenses so that I could either, if the storm's far enough away, I could push out to it. And then uh, pick up, find somebody's lightning sensor that you like to use. And, okay, now know, how does the lightning sensor work? It senses the pre-flash of lightning oh, okay. and it fires the camera. That's cool. How yeah. much does one of those cost in uh, general? The, the, I know that there's a range. There's a range. Uh, anywhere from 100 and probably 20 to 300, 400 dollars. Uh, the one that I give to my guests on the workshop is by Lightning Bug. Yeah, that's the one I've heard of. Yeah. And I so, think they had a booth at the last conference that we had here. Oh, okay. So, um, yeah, so I switched over to them and uh, it works just fine and we go out and have a great time. That sounds so fun, mm -hmm. although I, I, I don't know, although I've been overcoming a lot of my fear. <laughs> we, work out, we work out of the vehicle quite a bit, if, if you can get to the storm and set it up. So how many people go on these? The lightning workshop is limited to four because that's what I can carry in the truck. Well, that's what made me think of it. Yeah. <laughs> and see, on the other workshops with the nature workshop, you could choose to ride with the instructor or you could follow the instructor. The lightning workshop, it's built into the cost you're riding with the instructor. I see. So when I say pile in, we pile in. Okay, yeah, four people in your truck. That'd be a little tight. Yeah, uh, yeah. it's not so bad. The no? truck's got a lot of room in it. Yeah. yeah. Got, he's got a big monster truck for the Everglades. <laughs> 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 now, do you have a favorite location for that type of stuff? Is Everglades it? National Park. Yeah. And only because the road, the way the road weaves through the park all the way down to Flamingo, it, it'll take you north, south, east, and west. So we've actually photographed lightning on one side of the storm driven through the storm and then photograph rainbows on the other side. Oh, how cool. So it's got a, it's a great road for that. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Now, now to lead a photo workshop, you and I both know you need a permit Correct. to do that. But can somebody just do that without a permit? Just oh, to, absolutely. They don't need a permit just to do photography. No, 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 unless as long as they don't take out uh, models or they're not going to do any uh, damage to it or they don't need special access. Uh, uh, matter of fact, National Geographic just finished a video uh, that they did in the, the park out there. So they were out there for quite a while. And I think for what they did, they needed a permit for it. Yeah, I would bet. But for, yeah. gui for guiding people, you need it. But if you're just going to go out and shoot and have a good time and create fine art, you don't need a permit. That's good to know. So, um, What else do I want to ask you about? So you do a bird photography workshop too, I though. Do. When is that? Uh, January, February? It's February. I was I, gonna I, say, that's when the birds I, are there, well, right? I, I moved it for the Iceland workshop, so I don't, I'd have to look and see what the dates are, but it's in February this year, and or next year, 2018. Is the Iceland in, in January? Is that uh, end of February, or middle of February. So oh, we're going, so we're going to Iceland. in one month. Yeah, and we're going to Iceland in the wintertime. So some of, the, some of my friends and guests have been on workshops when we went to um, Fairbanks for Northern Lights. They want to photograph Northern Lights in Iceland. So that's what, that's what prompted it was I had a handful of people say, hey, I'd really like to go to Iceland to photograph Northern Lights. Can we set it up? And I called the Nature Workshops, and he said yes. We'll use, he's over, he's, if he's not there now, he just come back. He goes in summer, has been going for a handful of years. So he said, we'll set one up in the wintertime. Ah, yeah. so he already kind of knows the area too then. Yes, yeah. So he can help. Well, and, and the Icelandic guide that he uses. So we're using the same guide that he uses in the summertime. My son went on his honeymoon there. Oh, really? <laughs> to Iceland. <laughs> Two Florida kids, I guess. They what, wanted what to do something year? different. Uh, January. Yeah, oh, that's awesome. Crazy. I, I was like, you're going where? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and of course, it cost them a fortune not to go there, not to be there, but in clothes, because 
neither one of them had any winter clothes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's, that's the key, is having the right amount of clothes. It worked out for me, though, because I took a trip, not that far, but I went to Savannah mm -hmm. in February the next year. And uh, it's winter in Savannah, Georgia in February. And thank God my daughter-in-law had a coat I could borrow because I don't have any winter clothes either. Mm -hmm. my, one of my goals in life is to never be cold. <laughs> well, how are you going to photograph polar bears or northern lights? I don't have any interest. Oh, got it. <laughs> got it. No, you're going out in the Everglades. The lightning, that interests me. Oh, okay. But, well, not, but I'll be warm. Yeah. yeah. I like to be warm. I live in Florida. I grew up in Michigan. I didn't like it. Oh, okay. No offense to Michigan. I love Michigan in the summer. Yeah. <laughs> but I don't like to be cold. All right, so what else can we talk about? So what kind of, do you have any special equipment that like is your favorite equipment for your different subjects? Depends on where I'm going with the birds. I have a 300-2.8, I put a 2X teleconverter on so I can get in tight and close. And most of the places we go, like you guys do, is Shark Valley. So you get really, I mean, you could see 20 species of birds right on that side of that road. Yeah, and they're like right there. Yeah, so a lot of it depends on the subject. Um, night photography, I got a lot of fast lenses that I use. Uh, I'm a Canon shooter and I uh, got a couple of Canon cameras, but... Uh, what do you think about, are you a Canon, Canon shooter, all Canon lenses, or...? It's funny you ask that. Just yesterday, I received that new Sigma 14 millimeter 1.8 okay. art lens. Um, for, and I did it, I, I bought it for the night photography workshop. That's the first non-Canon lens I've ever used. I just bought my first non-Canon, which is a Sigma, a year and a half ago, I guess, I, okay. and I impulse bought it. I would, do you know who Roman, I don't even know his last name, Roman with Roman, do you know who no, he is? No. He's, he's a really good speaker, so I, I really, really enjoy his talk. So he came here to Naples and spoke at the camera club, and he was raving about the 150 to 600 contemporary, because they make a sport mm -hmm. and a contemporary, mm -hmm. and the contemporary doesn't have as much weather sealing and all this other stuff, so it weighs much less which is still, is still heavy. Mm -hmm. But anyway, I bought that that day because the Sigma guy was there and I just bought it. I didn't even need a long lens, <laughs> but it's a good lens. It's a nice lens. I got rid of my Canon 100 to 400 because I like this one better. Well, of course, it goes to 600 millimeters is the main reason. Right. But the Canon 100 to 400, and I think the new one is different, but the old one had the uh, push pull. Push pull, yeah. and I could never get used to that. I just didn't like it. No. So. That 28 to 300 I use for lightning, so that, that's kind of a specific lens for lightning. It's push-pull, and I've had it in Alaska a few times, and because it's not as weather-sealed, uh, I've had to have it repaired. Uh, so I don't like the push-pull, and that's one of those lenses I'm, I'm, I hate it, but I like it, you know? Yeah, I just couldn't get used well, to it, and then Canada, I was so slow with it, you know? And Canon did change now to the 100 to 400s a dial. That's what I thought. Yeah. I thought I heard that, but, but I had already had, I already got the... The Sigma, and right. it's a gr it is a really good lens. Mm -hmm. So I haven't even put this one to use yet. So yeah, I, you I just got, got it go yesterday. I just got it yesterday, so it showed up. Well, you'll have to let us know. Yeah. Maybe you'll do a review for us. Uh, maybe. <laughs> Perhaps. I'm always thinking. Right. <laughs> um, all right. So okay, I want you to tell me about your abstract photography, because that's something a little unique that you do. Yeah, it's, uh, it's a lot of fun. So different, different ways of doing it. And you still got to follow compositional guidelines, color association, things like that, and, and movement and flow in it. But uh, one of the things we'll do that I'll teach when we're out there is a, a zoom burst, where while it's exposing, get a half second or one second exposure and zoom your lens, like okay. a 70 to 200 works oh. great for that. I always call uh, it zoom blur. You call it zoom burst? Zoom burst, yeah. Okay. Well, it, it's a burst or a, a um, and then, uh, well, one is the, I vert love that. the vertical I love pan. I love that. The vertical, yeah. And even if you do night photography and you you do a, a we sh when we shoot time lapse, you have probably 120 to 240 photos that you can use into a time lapse. If you stack those together and get star trails, technically that's an abstract too because it's not how our eyes see. Right. So um, it, it's just a lot of fun to try to create something that's beyond the standard shot people are seeing. So uh, if I go into an area in the Everglades where the trees have burned and they're charred and black and we got a beautiful blue sky, now you got your black and your blues you could play with. Oh, uh, I do have one that I think is on the website. I called it um, Mystic Sunset. I had it in an art show three years ago, on, and it's 24 by 36. And uh, it's pine trees with an orange sunset. I, I did the zoom burst, and I, I really liked it. Well, I had it in a, uh, a show 
and a woman walked in, and it was off to the side. She said hello to me. She glanced at it. She goes, oh, my God, there's a heart in that. So I changed the name to Nature's Heart. Oh. And I, now I ask people, can you find the heart in this photograph? Women find it more than men find it. But wow. uh, there's a heart. There's actually a heart shape in this photograph. You know what? You just reminded me of something that I get this advice, and I give this advice on a regular basis. And, and so many of the great artists are good at this. You need a story with your art piece. Yes. And that's a story. Yes. I mean, that's a good story. Mm -hmm. And plus you've got, especially if you're doing an art fair, you've got a conversation piece. Correct. To kind of draw people in and get them involved in your artwork. That is great. Now, do you do a lot of art fairs? or? Uh, not this past year. Previous years I've done a couple of art shows. Uh, but this year I've had uh, three gallery exhibits. Okay. And uh, people have picked up images out of the gallery exhibits, too. Okay. So, um, yeah, it store and everybody that get, buys one of mine because of the way I print they get a certificate of authenticity and they kind of get the story and the thought process for the shot so you're right it, 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 it's important to have a story with your image because people will connect with it yeah I mean that's great with the heart I yeah. love that yeah, is that picture on your website I think it is I, I think if you go to or I'm maybe, almost positive maybe it we is. could put it on the show notes if you if you know where it is, if you'll send it to me, I'll put it in the show notes. I'm wondering if it's one I sent you, because you used two or three that I sent you, and I, th I sent you five. My favorite one was the one that you have on the cover of your book, which we're going to talk about soon. Yeah, um, the Z tree. I love so that I, picture. So I will, I will send you Nature's Heart. If I haven't, I will send that's it a, to you. That's just a great story. Yeah. So now, I, I like abstract. I really do. So I want to hear about, um, you told me a story earlier today, and I want you to share it with our audience about selling your work because you had an interior designer who approached you about your beautiful landscape yes. work. Yes. So tell us about that. Tell me that story. An interior designer saw one of my pieces. Uh, I have one called Sunset Alligator, and uh, Gator alum are buying this. So it's a 60-inch by 24-inch piece, and it's basically a silhouette of an alligator uh, with an orange reflection on water. Okay. Told you that to tell you this. Uh, an interior designer came in, saw it, and said, who did that? I'd like to speak to him. So I, she reached out to me, I talked to her, and my wife and I went to meet her, and she said, bring me a bunch of your work. And so I print on canvas. So most everything was rolled up. I took her all of what I thought was my best Everglades shot. I had one shot where I paddled a canoe with a friend out to uh, uh, a key, uh, one of the islands in the Keys, and we were going to shoot a sunrise. Sunrise failed. It was overcast and cloudy, so I shot alligator reef light with a channel marker. Uh, with a 600 millimeter lens, so I had to alligator, what? alligator reef light. Oh, it's, okay. a, it's a light structure over uh, alligator reef, I guess. Oh, oh, okay. So I photographed it, 600 millimeter lens, so it was way off, and uh, I started playing with it. I over exaggerated the colors, I over sharpened it, and I created a a watercolor color pencil effect. Okay. My wife said, "Please don't take that. It, it, it's not what you do. You're an Everglades photographer." And so I just rolled it up, threw it in the truck. When I went down and met with her, I pulled everything out. I'm proud as can be. She starts flipping through them. She says, seen that, derivative, seen that. Nobody shoots that anymore. She just, she just ripped everything <laughs> apart. I think there were 11 of them. Oh, and, my uh, God. Your and you heart got, must have been, like, sinking to your stomach. I could take a critique. I really can. Really? It was okay, yeah, because it, if it doesn't. Even somebody being that harsh? If, yeah, even if it Those doesn't work. Those people over in Miami are a little tougher Oh, she was, she was brutal. I love you for it. But anyway. <laughs> Um, so I said, I got one more piece in the truck, and, and I said, let me go get it. And I, I ran out to the truck, I grabbed this piece, 60 inch by 24, I unrolled it. As soon as she saw it, she goes, I want that. I said, no problem. Do you want, and I stretch them, and I said, do you want it framed? She says, yes. So I pulled out some frames, she came to the office, I had frames and liners, and I usually put a liner with everything, and she says, I don't want a liner, I want this frame, and it was a quarter round frame. Okay. Uh, I think it was three and a half by three and a half quarter round. I framed it, I gave it to her, she sold it on consignment and, uh, in about three weeks. Wow. Yeah, so uh, there's a lady in Texas that has a one-of-a-kind R.L. Chaplin photography piece. Oh, my god! So I'll probably never do that one again. No, you don't reprint? I do, but not that one. Oh. That, that takes a special client. Somebody, wow. it, it'll, it, it fit their home, and she liked it, and... Uh, I was pleased as punch. Now, have you done work with this interior designer again? No. Uh, they had another piece that they couldn't sell, and then they closed down about two years ago. Oh, that's another tough business. So. Yeah. Especially, yeah. or it might have been four years now, so it, 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 was, it was a while ago that they closed down. But uh, I found it interesting that when you're taking your best, the eyes are sharp, you got the catch light, you got everything that we teach, the feathers are sharp, the landscape's grand with big clouds, and, and it was too derivative for what she was trying to do. 
but she knew her clients. Yeah, she sure did. Mm -hmm. She sold it in three weeks. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's a great story. Yeah. I love that story. So, yeah, that's the tip to photographers. Don't get offended. You know, if somebody likes it and they, don't, they like it, they like it. If they don't, they don't. And I judge for a camera club, so there's things I'll, I'll judge and critique. That until, if it's framed on a wall, I won't say a word about it. But if you ask me to judge and critique it, well, don't get offended when a judge says something. Exactly. Take it for what it's worth. Yeah. Does he pull a crap, or did he make did he make sense? Yeah, I mean, people are just people. Judges are people too. And and part of the thing, you know, for for us, because we I judge a lot, and you've been in the business a long time. I've been in the business long time. <laughs> I get really tired of some of the same old shots. And some people have never seen them before. Right. And that's something you, ha you have to remember. And that, because I'm still a wedding photographer too. Mm -hmm. You know, as a wedding photographer, you have to remember that they're only getting married once, hopefully, uh, mm -hmm. maybe twice. <laughs> it's not like they're seeing wedding pictures all the time. They don't know, you know what Correct. I mean, that that's overdone or whatever. So it's like okay to take some of the same shots. And because some people will like them, yes. you know? We had a guy, I had a guy, Joe Parisi, on the show who, um, he, he mostly does bird photography because that's what sells. Mm -hmm. Not because it's his, although he's very good at it, but it's not his favorite type of thing to photograph. He likes street photography, but that doesn't sell. Right. So Fun to look at at a show or a gallery, fun to hang in your own home. It just doesn't sell. Yeah, so he does a lot of bird, which of course I think he loves it. It's a social, he and Jim Roberlard, who was also a guest here, they're buddies and they go out like at least one morning a week mm -hmm. and it's kind of their, their bromance thing too, I think. Nice. <laughs> mm -hmm. Get out there and crack a dawn, take those bird pictures. Mm -hmm. Well, you're a bird photographer too. I'll photograph anything in the Everglades. Anything and everything. Anything, anything. huh? We always find something to shoot. Um, the hot part of the day when people say the, the, the light's no good, I'll find a way to show somebody how to use a cloud for high key photography. Or we go into a, um, a hammock and we find a Florida tree snail and I challenge them to photograph that with macro. So there's always something to find and shoot. But you gotta kinda get off the road to see it. Yes. Although on the other hand, sometimes you can just pull over and get some good shots. <laughs> Those are the birds because the birds are accustomed to cars and if you find a bird in the wild, he's not gonna hold for you, but absolutely. Yeah, 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 I couldn't, I, my friend Chris, he's like, Kara, Kara. I'm like, I've never seen one of those before, you know, <laughs> just <laughs> he pulls over, you know. So you've been over to Dinner Island Ranch then? No, that was just on the side of the road on 41 oh, really? somewhere. During the bird trip, if somebody wants to see a crested Kara, Kara, we run over to Dinner Island Ranch. Ah, just south of Lake I have Petrovia. heard of it, but I haven't been there yeah. yet. So, so many places I haven't been yet. Just in Florida, and it's like, oh, I want to go see this and that and the other thing, and I'm going to. Maybe I will use this book called Everglades National Park, A Photographic Destination, as my guide by R.L. Chaplin. <laughs> Tell yep. me about the book. Well, uh, I have a co-author, Beth Ruggiero. Uh, she's the one that actually came to me and said, uh, are you interested in doing a book with me? And um, I know the Everglades, and so the answer was yes. Uh, I, and I tease people because I'm $800 a day for a private tour, or you could buy a $20 book and go everywhere that I take my clients. Ah. Yeah. But uh, it, has, it has a little bit of history on Everglades National Park. It has uh, tips and techniques. So when we go to a place, um, I was going to see if I could find one here for you real quick. And I'm not sure how that will work on the camera. But uh, when we go to a place, and we, we, we go to plan to shoot a sunset, and then when you get there, the sunset doesn't work out like uh, you wanted it to work out. There's still always something to shoot. So what this, what this has is tips and tricks on how to approach an area even if you didn't get what you were looking for. Oh, that's great. So um, so on this day, I don't know how to do this with the, the camera, I went to shoot a sun set at Sissel Pond, uh -huh. but we had these uh, her, uh, Sahara sands come over us. Mm -hmm. And so what I did is I utilized the sands as a filter, underexposed by about a stop, to try to get the, uh, to be able to photograph the sun and find a, just a dead pine tree to silhouette. So it's, uh, it's just a way to approach photographing in the Everglades or anywhere else for that matter. That's really good advice. And by the way, you've brought this up a couple of times, so I want to explain it to the audience. Believe it or not, even though we live in Florida, we get sand from the Sahara Desert, right? Mm -hmm. And what it does is it gives a haze. Mm -hmm. And so the picture that, because this is also a podcast, so they can't see what you were trying to point out, but it was like a hazy sun. Yes. And that really cool. 
That's and really cool. Utilizing what nature gives you. Well, this summer, or was it fall? This fall, or fall. This spring, when we had all the wildfires. Yes. That brought some amazing pictures from many photographers because of that haze mm -hmm. from all the smoke, even though it was terrible. I mean, we had a terrible, terrible time, but, <laughs> but whatever. <laughs> so now where can someone get this book? Uh, if you want a Kindle version, go to Amazon.com and just uh, search for Everglades National Park, a photographic destination. It could be ordered uh, from my website, or actually, if you just go to Everglades.photography, it could be ordered from there. Oh, uh, the, phys you the, got the that physical website, book. Huh? I got that website. Good one. <laughs> and, uh, uh, or if you're coming into Everglades National Park and the Big Cypress, the, the bookstores for uh, Everglades National Park and the Big Cypress are carrying that book. Awesome. So, yeah, Everglades.photography, bookstore, or go to Amazon and search it. Now, you know, you've got something going on that uh, I think is a good idea for like photographers okay in this area of course we have the Everglades mm -hmm. but if you're a photographer who lives in Acadia area or someplace that has a, a nice area you have been volunteering and gotten involved in the Everglades found not foundation but Everglades Florida National Parks Association uh, which we were doing business as the Everglades Association okay yes and in your local camera club. Yes. And you actually founded a camera club, right? Correct. And yes, and, and the, the, the camera club, I, I was asked by Homestead Center for the Arts to, to get a camera club started in the city of Homestead. Okay. And I didn't know what to do. So I put the right people in place. I got the executive director from the Everglades Association, Jim Sutton, to help me. I got a councilman, Stephen Shelley, from Homestead to help me. A um, uh, friend of mine who has uh, camera club experience, uh, Bob Richardson. And there's one, oh, and the publisher of the local newspaper, uh, uh, Dale Machesic. And I said, would you guys be directors of this camera club and help me get it started? So I didn't have to do anything once I put the right people in place. Okay. And we had our first call. Uh, we advertised it in the paper, got our first call, and um, uh, about 20, 25 people showed up. And uh, well, you had Jason Eldridge on not too long yeah. ago. Yeah. Uh, he volunteered he, to be the um, president. And he's the guy that, I, he's the reason the club started. Because I, as directors, when we had the meeting, I said, if nobody wants to step up and be an officer, we shake hands, we jump in our trucks, and we see each other in the Everglades. And Jason said, I'll be president. So he's our founding president. Okay. Now, by virtue of membership in our club, you also get a membership into the Everglades Association. So part of it becomes a donation, which gets you a card, which gets you a 15% discount in all the books, uh, the retail stores. Oh, so I could get 15% off this book. If you join the Everglades Association. <laughs> yes. Yep. But being involved in the Everglades Association has helped you, your career as a photographer, would you say? Would you say that's yes, true? Yes, absolutely, for networking. And that, that was where you went, and I got sidetracked. That's Sorry okay, about that. That's okay. Uh, but our camera club volunteers in the park, we did, uh, if you've ever gone into the main entrance down south, there's the boardwalk at Rock Reef Pass. We mm -hmm. rebuilt that two years ago. And uh, when you say we real, you went the, out the there camera with club hammers folks. and nails yes. and... Yes, as volunteers. They call us VIPs, volunteer in park. Oh. So, uh, and now this year we're working on a set of tent platforms in an area called Hidden Lake that the kids use when they come out, and we're rebuilding some tent platforms that had, had gone into disrepair out there. So, not only the camera club and the networking and the knowing the folks down there, but the volunteering and giving back, it, it's just a good thing to do. Yeah. You know, so. That's awesome. They always, they always look for help. But um, we're not interp type people, but if you, you, want, you have something you want us to build, give us a hammer and the boards, and they provide everything. Uh, for the boardwalk, I would go every morning to the maintenance yard, pick up a trailer, go out. Guys would meet me out there, and we'd, we'd rebuild the boardwalk. That's awesome. Yeah. That my friend Chris Hopkins, he volunteers out, uh, I don't know exactly where, but I know he's out there with the machete cutting <laughs> trails and stuff like that. Yeah, we don't do the trail <laughs> thing. We're more of the construction type. He's a macho guy. Yeah. Um, but I think that just getting involved though in in your in the state parks wherever you are if that's if that's your passion if you're photographing there mm -hmm. you know i know some of the guests we've had have said donate some of your pictures to like audubon society and you know it, it it's good networking mm -hmm. it helps them it helps you it's win-win all all mm -hmm. the way around so yeah. i think that's really good no, good great. advice or good good strategy even if it wasn't a strategy <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it was more might not have been finding a, strategy, finding but a it, need and filling it. It, it sounds like it's done well for your photography, too, though. Yeah, yeah, it has, it, for, for the recognition, yeah. 
All right, so what else do we want to talk about? I'm trying to, I went through my, I went through my teleprompter. <laughs> this is a problem with me whenever I see somebody before the show, then I always like, I already, did I already ask him that? can't remember. Well, since you and I are both uh, workshop instructors and we do it the right way, we could talk about workshops. Let's talk about it. Um, there's a lot of people that are doing workshops without permits and the insurances and things like that. Oh, we, oh yeah. See, we, we did have this conversation yeah, earlier because I was like, rah, rah, rah. So, you know, when you're a legitimate business, it's tough to compete against the guys that will charge 99 bucks to go out there for a, a day to do something, but they don't have to carry the same product that we have to carry. Yeah, because uh, um, liability insurance is, I mean, a cheap, at the least, it's 30, 30, 40 bucks a month. Mm -hmm. But that... The permits. At the least, and then if you have a well, vehicle we that you're adding about, onto it, yeah. yeah. The, the uh, permit that we talked about, mm -hmm. like Big Cypress is like a thousand dollars a year. Uh, Shark Valley or Everglades, Everglades National Park is what? That's three fifty. Three fifty a I year. Three fifty. I mean, it's crazy. Right. It costs a lot of money to run a legitimate business. And it and it's the right thing to do. And and you know, Jason does it too. He he doesn't just do workshops without having the right permits. He had one in, in the Everglades. He let that one go because, you know, it, it's a tough place to, to photograph, but he's got one for the Smokies. So I help support anybody that's willing to do it right, and I don't yeah. have a problem with competition. What I have a problem with is the competition where they're not doing the right thing or what we do. Right. And uh, along with that, I end up with people on my workshops that, that are sorry they've gone on some of those trips. Right. Well, it, to me, it, it is a character thing because from just talking to you, you know, you talk about how important your customers are and here's what I teach and this is what I try to help them and, you know, you're all about making sure that your customer has a good experience mm -hmm. and part of that good experience is doing things legally and right. Mm -hmm. Where somebody who's like trying to undercut, you wonder, you know, what else are they undercutting? Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. And I told you the story about the guy that I talked to. He's an amazing photographer and a swamp guy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And I talked to him about, you know, maybe working with us, and then I found out that he's doing everything illegal, and I was like, no, sorry, you got to. And they get away with it. Um, and he's gotten away with it for many, yeah. many years, so But I it, guess. it may or may not be the best experience for, for the customer. And then I've had folks come on the workshop, and I don't set up a tripod typically and shoot. Uh, I carry a camera. I photograph them working. I will set a camera up and say, this is what I'm seeing. Uh, what do you think? And yeah. then I'll look at what they're shooting. But I have had people say that I've never been on a workshop. Usually the workshop leader is the first guy out with the first tripod set up. Yeah. He'll tell you don't go stand on those sand dunes, and he'll run up onto the sand dune. Yeah. So I hear that type of thing. We so hear I, that a lot, yeah. too. So for me, one it's of the It's about them, not about us, or, but you. Or they're using their clients to get them to a place to photograph. And right. that, uh, that isn't what I have to do or don't want to do that because it's not the right service to provide. Rick Salmon... Uh, just wrote an article, two articles actually, on his blog. One of them was what not to do on a workshop, mm -hmm. and one of them was what, but it was from from a leader's perspective. Right. And he had pictures of, um, you know, he lined his people up wherever he was. I can't remember where it was, but then you saw him reaching his, of course, he's tall, <laughs> but he was taking pictures above them so that he was behind them. They right. all had their tripods, and he was just hand-holding, taking pictures above them because he wasn't going to take up a spot, right. you know? Because, well, you're going to Iceland. He was telling me it's really crowded there now, so that's going to be a challenge for right. you as a workshop leader to make sure all of your people have a spot that they can get the great pictures, you know? Right, and, and our group stay small. Uh, yeah. So... And now, do you do you have limits on how many people can come on a workshop? Well, I know how many can come for on your night uh, photography. <laughs> four on four the lightning. On the lightning. Other than that, it's eight. Eight, okay. And other than, to be honest with you, I love it when I get four or five because a group of eight is fun, but it changes the dynamic of where we can go. Uh, you don't make as much money, don't make any money, but it, it, it's nice to have a smaller group for me because I can take them on things without impacting the, uh, the environment. So if it's a group of eight, we may stay closer to um, maintain trails. Okay. Uh, if it's a group of four, sometimes we'll do swamp walks if they're up to it. But, um, but the maximum we do at the nature workshops is eight. And uh, for the lightning workshop, I keep it to four so we can travel together. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. we, yeah, mine, well, of course, the ladies' weekend for me is only three because we stay in an Airbnb with four bedrooms. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 
just kind of like your truck. Well, that's how many people fit. But how, <laughs> how nice is that to have an intimate workshop like that, though? It's the best way. Yeah. It is the best way. In fact, one of my favorite uh, ladies' weekends was uh, a mother, daughter, and daughter-in-law. Mm -hmm. And it was just great because it was like a family weekend right. for them. And, uh, and they're was, allowing you to share in it. Yeah, what doing it too. was awesome. It was so much fun. But they're all fun. They're all fun because everybody, when you have a group that small, especially, you would just become such good friends with each other. Right. You mm -hmm. know. And the, the other thing to bring to a workshop is a good attitude. You may have other people that you don't like or don't agree with. I've had people that weren't necessarily self-aware. They would walk in front of a camera without oh, paying right. attention or without, yep. no, that they don't mean harm by it. So you got to try to to help those people realize what they're doing, but you can't let something like that upset you. And if I could share, I go on workshops to this day, so um, Roger with the Nature Workshops had an opportunity to go photograph polar bears in Kaktovik, Alaska. Okay. But we have to have a guy, an Alaska business license and Alaska guide. We went on that, and that Alaska guide is a good photographer, but he has his way of seeing. And uh, there was one incident I could share. We were on the bus, I had a 50 millimeter lens on, I saw a polar bear in the distance, but I wanted to shoot the ice leading out to the polar bear. I want to be the, uh, the environment with the bear in it. Okay. And I said, would you please stop so I could take this shot? He says, no, you want to photograph polar bears, we got to get over here. So he was, in his mind, was thinking long lens, head shots, right. bears on bones, something like that, and not thinking of, of the bear and the environment. Now, I use him now as a storytelling device, so he wasn't the best workshop leader and actually wasn't even a workshop, Fo photo tour leader, okay. because he didn't understand to give his clients what they were asking for, and he just thought everybody wanted to shoot and see the same way he shoots. Yeah. So I try to approach it that if you see a shot, tell me, we'll all jam on the brakes and we'll just go out and, and shoot it, and we never pass a shot. Oh, that's so, great. But taking it to a different level, photo tours and photo workshops are different. Okay. So photo workshop, I think, would be classroom intensive, maybe 50-50. Uh -huh. So I think what I do as I think about this is more of a photo tour with an educational element because we work in the field. Okay. And we don't necessarily go back and process, uh, you know, and, and things like that. That's kind of what we do too. We do very little. We do some classroom, right. but very little. And I know I've done, because I love to go to workshops too, but you know, one of the workshops I went to before I started leading workshops to St. Croix, I went on a workshop to St. Croix, even though I've got that connection there, I mm -hmm. went with somebody else just to kind of see what they did and things like that. And, oh my God, you're in the freaking gorgeous Caribbean island and she had us inside the hotel room all the time. Yeah. And I just thought, this is not what I'm doing. I don't want to be stuck in a hotel room when I'm on vacation in the because I was on vacation, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Yes, it's a it's a workshop, but I'm here for fun more than right. any, you know, I want to learn, I want to take pictures, but I want to have fun. Yes. And sitting inside a hotel room is not that much fun. And I think that's key is to know what to expect when you go to these workshops or photo tours. So am I, I, I put you to work. I keep you out long days. You can sleep in the truck while I'm driving if you want, but you're going to see things you wouldn't normally see. You're going to experience things you wouldn't normally experience. That's awesome. So um, I, I think sometimes, and I did have a gentleman, he happened to be the only one on the workshop. I will do a tour if there's only one person, but he didn't want to be out during the heat. So we went back to the hotel and I said, I'll pick you up in three hours. We'll come to find out he wouldn't watch the uh, Tarzan movie while he was uh, resting in the hotel. So it was more of a vacation for him. And yeah. because he was by himself, that was okay. But if I had a group of eight, it would have been different. So, uh, you know, you could be flexible with smaller groups or single people, but right. uh, so when you go, you have to have an open mind. You have to be patient. You have to know that you might be working around people that are got different skill sets and ideas. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you have to be patient with people because there are some people who are slow moving and, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah. I had uh, one workshop, a lady from New York and another lady who was from, I don't know where she was from, but she was just a slow moving kind of person and I thought that New York lady might kill her so I kind of <laughs> had to keep them a little separate, you know? <laughs> But by the end of the like third, third day or something, they were like best friends. But in the beginning, the New York lady was just not patient, you know? Mm -hmm. So she mm -hmm. was living up to that stereotype of just fast moving. But I think once you get out, you everybody, everybody relaxes yes. after a while, hopefully anyway, right? Yes. So what yeah. else, what else, what other tips do you have for, for workshop? What about workshop attendees? What would you say to somebody coming on one of your workshops? What do they, what do they need to do to be a good workshop attendee? 
Well, for the night workshop, because we're not going to have a lot of classroom time, I actually sent out an email last night with homework for them. Uh, how to work with your, because for, for night photography, we don't want to hurt our night vision. So we work with very little to no light, or we prefer that. So um, I, send out, I send out a homework thing for them to learn how to uh, find the buttons on their camera, oh. uh, learn how to work with their camera with just the camera light, um, learn how to review an image, learn how to put a lens on and off. So I gave them a whole list of things to do to try to learn to do in the dark. It, it does something for them. It makes it more enjoyable for them because there are stressors out there. We're going to be working at night when the mosquitoes are out. We want to get out. We want to get set up. And then we want to get back into the truck and get rid of the mosquitoes. And, and I tell them, bring laptops because we'll do classroom time in the truck. Pickup Truck University. <laughs> but, uh, so I, I, I do send people homework to do. But I think the best tip would be know your equipment. Boy, that is such... Uh, one of the things, and this probably happens to you as well, but I get at least one phone call a week during season, not always off season, saying, I'm going to Africa on a photo tour. I just bought this camera. I need to learn how to, t I need to learn photography, learn how to use this camera. Oh, when's your trip? Next week. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my gosh, how can you, you can't teach photography in a week, and you can't teach somebody a camera in a week. Mm -mm. Even if they're a good photographer, they're not going to learn a camera in a week. Right, that's a whole separate workshop is learning yes, your camera. Yes, your own camera. So, oh my gosh, it's just so common. People, and I think part of the problem is that we see so many beautiful pictures, and you take so many good pictures of your iPhone right now that you mm -hmm. think it's easy, and it's not still, there's still a learning curve to photography. Well, yes, and, and there is, along with that, it's work. You got to get out, you got to get up, you got to stand in the water for this shot, or you got to be here with the mosquitoes for this, or when we do northern lights, you've got to be in the sub-zero degree weather for the northern lights, and you got to know your equipment, so there's enough stressors on you. If you don't know it, it frustrates you when you're trying, when you yeah. should be out creating. Well, and I told you, my first night photography was very recent, and mm -hmm. you cannot see. Chris gave me... Uh, headlamp with the light, red light right. on it, but it's still really hard to see. And I don't let them use that, uh, even, or the green light. So a red, a red light doesn't hurt your night vision. The green light lets you see, but your camera picks all that up. So if we're shooting in a group, somebody's got a red oh, yeah. light on, it radiates out. So I You're try right. to teach everybody to... Because we, we all, there were only three of us, and we're like, turn the lights off, yep. you know? So if we could do it in the dark, and we're not hiking. If you're hiking, turn your light on. But if we could do it in the dark, nobody set up a red light. Because uh, some people will actually, uh, one lady uh, is coming back to the, she, went, well, she was with me last year, and she's coming back. So she'll be able to set up and work in the dark and start shooting before everybody else does. So if everybody else got red lights and green lights on, it'll start messing up her images. Oh, good so point. we just, so we try to, no. well, to a point, we'll give them time to get set up and be comfortable, but that's what the homework is for, is to try to get them able to be able to work that's in the dark. really good, good yeah. thing to do. So, you know, know, know your equipment. And if I find somebody's got a, a camera that they haven't used before, I'll print out and keep on my phone their instruction manual. We always do that, too. We so keep everybody's, because we say, please bring your manual. Please bring it. And so how many people do? Not so often. <laughs> and then you just, but you, you can download it, no pain, no strain, and keep a library of them on your That's phone or your iPad. That's what we do well, in Dropbox. That yeah. way you can just, if you need it, you can get it. Mm -hmm. But you don't have to keep everything downloaded on your phone that way Correct. either. So. So Love and, Dropbox. <laughs> so, and then, how do you teach your, or Joe teach your workshops? Do you teach manual, aperture priority? It do depends. You, do you have it that depends. discussion? It depends, is the answer to that. Mm -hmm. It depends on the level of the person mm -hmm. and what the workshop. Like my ladies only weekends, that's all about shooting a manual. That's kind of the point of the weekend. Mm -hmm. You're going to, by the end of the weekend, you are going to be shooting a manual comfortably. Mm -hmm. It's going to be second nature for you. So that's the point there. But with the bird photography, Joe takes people. Now, we limit ours to only five. Okay. So we have a very small group. So he works at the level of each person. Right. So some of them just, they're not going to learn manual. They're just not going to. So he'll put them in either shutter or aperture priority, whatever whatever works for them. Yeah. Do you have a preference on that? Well, night photography is always manual. Mm -hmm. um, lightning photography, because we want to try to get to a 40th or a 60th of a second at least, we try to do that. Um, but I primarily teach to get people started aperture priority. Okay. And I have a reason for that. 
aperture is our most limiting setting. Mm -hmm. So uh, let's just assume, let's, let's say we start at F1. F1, 1, 4, 2, 2, 8, 4, 5, 6, 8, and 16. If you have a camera that starts at F1 or 1, 4, you're only going to F16. Mm -hmm. But if you started at F2, 8, and went to F22, you're still only looking at eight stops of light. Okay. So time is almost infinite and your ISO is going to be to whatever your best um, ISO setting for the camera. So I have a 5DSR. Uh -huh. I, I, wouldn't, I couldn't print it at, at ISO 800, so I have to go to 400. So I'm working at 100, 200, and 400. Okay. My 1DX, I can go to 3200. So, but that's still uh, 100, 200, 400. What's that, 800, 1600? So that's still six, six stops of light. So I try to teach people to think in aperture and ask yourself, how much depth of field do I want? You set that, let the camera set the rest, take the shot, check the histogram, and then use exposure compensation to get where you want to be. Okay. So now it, that's it, on it, a tripod, though. That, well, you could even do it hand-holding. Uh, yeah. But, but it, then as you long get as into the danger of the shutter getting too slow. Too slow, exactly. That's so if it's on a tripod, then you get, yes. So the other way people will show up with, um, uh, what's that, auto ISO, so they could set their shutter speed where they want it and let everything else work. I, I'll tell you what, I, I think auto ISO is the best thing that ever happened to beginner photographers. <laughs> because they can still kind of get a feel for using, you know, aperture and, mm -hmm. and shutter speed without screwing up all their pictures. <laughs> right. And then what are you going to do with your photos? So I, I think on terms of printing large, so I know what my limits to the cameras are. So I have to, to factor it there. And then if I'm shooting a great landscape, I want to be at f22, f32 but I'll let the camera tell me, well, that's a two or three second exposure. And there's nothing I can do about it, that it is what it is. So we start with aperture priority, then if everybody can understand how they relate to each other, then we can shift into manual. Yeah. And, then, uh, and then usually the people that show up that shoot manual only, they don't want any attention at all. They just say, point me at my subject, right. and they go. Yeah, yeah. So. I want to talk more about this, but now we ran out of time. <laughs> okay. <laughs> what, uh, so what's coming up? Your next thing is the night. Sky. Next one is night, then this That's year. That's August, and do you have openings for that? Uh, yes, full? there are four openings for it. Okay, still. so that's Aug That's coming up soon. Yes. And Aug if I was here, I would be going, man. That sounds, to me, that sounds like so much fun. It's a blast. It's exhausting. And you stay and it's in Florida blast. City? Or no, no, we stay wait. up off of Kendall, Kendall okay. Drive. There's okay. a Best Western Plus, because we don't always go to Everglades National Park. Everglades National Park's a small portion of the other places that we go. Uh, right up into Denner Island Ranch or sometimes down the trail okay. to uh, some of the management areas out there. Okay. So we, I, I got them centrally located so they could sleep longer. So we know where to get your book. Yes. Either mo Best places on your website. Everglades.photography. And then, and that's easy to remember. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> really good. You got, good. you got lucky on that. I thought I got so lucky when I found understandphotography.com. I couldn't believe in my luck. Well, guess what everybody thinks my website is? Understanding. Uh, yeah. There's no ing. <laughs> and I can't get that. I try to get that website. Some Italian guy owns it. He won't sell it. Or he'll sell it to me for, I think, $30,000 or well, something. Well, of course he yeah, would. Yeah, you know. <laughs> so whatever. All right. So what else should we know? So your other website is RL... RLChaplinPhotography.com. RLChaplinPhotography.com. Is that a different website it's or a different is that the website. same website that? No, I have a website just for the book and for, uh, and it, it, it'll end up being one I'm going to actually move and incorporate into because I just recently got that, that uh, website. Okay. Yeah. So I'll be moving more over to it. But right now, the Everglades.photography is only the book. Oh, I see. So RLChaplinPhotography.com, you can see where the workshops are. They should link all back to the nature workshops except for the private tours. And I sell some product on there, fish and pole. Uh, Fish and pole flashlights, bug tamer bug suits, bug jackets, <laughs> and things that I use in, in the Everglades. And then, of course, I've got a, a, a YouTube channel, RL Chaplin Photography. So, youtube.com forward slash RL Chaplin Photography and uh, the Facebook page. Okay, and we're going to put all those links in the show notes so that you, you don't have to remember all that stuff that he just said. <laughs> just go to understandphotography.com and click on the show notes and you'll, you'll see all that stuff. We usually have the show notes done by Monday, Tuesday every week. So I get the YouTube video up usually by Saturday okay. and then the notes done by Monday or Tuesday. So well, all that stuff will be that. What else do we need to know? I, you need to know I really appreciate you inviting me over to do I this. I really appreciate you My coming My first over. time doing something like this, and I had a blast. You did well. Thank High you five. very much. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. 
So next week on the Understand Photography Show, my guest is the owner of Johnson Photo Imaging, which is a camera store in Bradenton, Florida. Lemoyne Johnson is going to give us tips on photographing the solar eclipse that's coming up in August. He's actually going to travel to, I forget now, you're going to have to stay tuned. I think he's going to Canada to photograph it. So he is going to give us lots of good advice on photographing the solar eclipse. That's next Friday at 4 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time live on our Facebook page, which is Understand Photography. <laughs> so hopefully you'll join us live. If not, remember you can always see the show on YouTube or listen to us on iTunes. It's called the Understand Photography Show. I'm Peggy Farron. Thank you for watching episode 46 and we will see you next week. Get up.